Good morning, everyone. At the outset, let me thank the organizers of Act 2021 for the opportunity to talk to you regarding the evolution of anesthesiology as a speciality. Why is it important to examine our past? Now, it tells us of our heritage, of how we got to where we are. It helps us to appreciate what we have today and to place our practice in perspective. It provides clues to the characteristics of successful persons and of the discovery process. Finally, it may inspire us to add to the rich history of our profession. Now, according to Bible, God created Eve from the rib of Adam after putting him to sleep. Thus, he became the first anesthesiologist in the world. Medieval anesthesia was both primitive and barbaric when compared to the standards employed today. The most common before the 15th century was probably the use of liberal quantities of alcohol, plus or minus opium and a wooden stick to bite down upon. However, some of the substances used in the period still hold strong today, such as opium, and some are even being rediscovered, such as cannabis in the field of chronic pain. Opium analgesia was described by Hippocrates, and it's certainly the longest standing substance used in anesthesia throughout history and into the modern day. Mandrogra plant or the mandrake plant, which has a humanoid shape in its root. When it is pulled out from the soil, it gives out a shriek and on anybody hearing the shriek just dies. So this has been popularized in the Harry Potter series where you can see the both Harry Potter and his friends are wearing uh, noise canceling headphones to prevent them from hearing the shriek of the mandrogra plant and you can extract alkaloids from its roots, that is the tropa alkaloids, which are both anticholinergic and hallucinatory in properties and have analgesic properties too. Arabic alchemists were perhaps some of the most advanced in their beliefs on anesthesia in the 12th and 13th centuries, employing techniques such as the soporific sponge, which was a sponge steeped in hashish, opium, and other herbal aromatics. If you look at the picture, you can see the person standing in the head and has covered both the nostrils and the mouth of the patient uh, with a soporific sponge through which the patient was breathing. The other techniques that were in vogue was the hypnosis and inhalation of the vapors of alcohol. And in the 17th and 18th century, we had the industrial and scientific revolution. And there was the synthesis of ether and uh, the discovery of gases. The discovery of nitrous oxide is credited to uh, Joseph Priestley and Lavoisier is credited to the discovery and naming of oxygen. And Humphrey Davy looked into the chemical properties and uh, also uh, he was a proponent of uh, using these gases to treat illness. However, people were more interested in their recreational use of these agents. So ether frolics were arranged. Similarly, exhibition of laughing gas, that is nitrous oxide, was arranged, wherein the elite in the society used to come and uh, uh, use these agents and get inebriated. However, on March 30th, 1842, Crawford W. Long administered the first anesthetic using ether in Jefferson, Georgia. However, he forgot to publish this in an article. He pub published this article, and this event was therefore not publicized. The American Medical Association of the United States celebrates National Doctors' Day on March 30th to commemorate the date on which Crawford Long administered the first ether anesthetic for surgery. In Hartford, Connecticut, uh, on 10th of uh, December, 1844, Garden, Gardner Quincy Colton, uh, a traveling showman, gave a demonstration of inhalation of, uh, of nitrous oxide. In the audience was Horace Wells, a dentist, who sought ways of easing the pain of removing the patient's rotten tooth before fixing dentures. He was thoughtful and he noted that there was a cut on the knee of uh, Samuel Cooley, who had inhaled nitrous oxide and he had injured his shin. However, this Samuel Cooley did not show any apparent discomfort and thereby Horace Wells realized that he might have found a solution to provide an analgesia for extraction, dental extraction. Discussions led to an experiment the following morning during which Wells had one of his own teeth removed by a colleague John Riggs after Colton administered nitrous oxide to Wells. Wells learned how to make nitrous oxide and used it in his practice till he was confident enough to demonstrate the technique at the nearest major medical center at Boston. 
the scene shifted to Massachusetts General Hospital and Horace Wells uh, decided to do a public demonstration of the analgesic properties of nitric oxide. However, it failed and he was booed by the audience who had come to watch the show and they shouted humbug. Thus, the use of nitrous oxide for medical purposes fell into disrepute. Morton, W.T.G. Morton was another dentist. He was, uh, his mentor was uh, Dr. Charles Jackson and Charles Jackson suggested to Morton that ether could be used as a uh, analgesic agent or even an anesthetic agent. And Morton tried ether on many of his uh, friends and patients uh, on whom he did dental extraction and he found that it was a, a very good agent providing good anesthesia. And on October 16th, 1846, he decided to publicly demonstrate the use of ether at Massachusetts General Hospital. And the surgeon was John Collins Warren and the patient was Edward Gilbert Abbott who had a tumor in his neck. He was anesthetized by W.T.G. Morton and uh, the patient did not feel pain. And upon ending the surgery, the surgeon Warren quipped, gentlemen, this is no humbug. And the news of this event traveled rapidly around the world and Morton published his experience. Now there were four people who laid claim to be the discoverer of anesthesia, Long, Wells, Morton or Jackson. So there is still a controversy that is going on regarding who is the real discoverer of anesthesia. Coming to the United Kingdom in 1847, Dr. James Simpson, he was a respected obstetrician in England. He administered chloroform to a mother during labor and he then published his uh, study as a new anesthetic a substitute for sulfuric ether. And he was a proponent of chloroform anesthesia. Later on, Dr. John Snow, he was an English physician who administered chloroform to Queen Victoria during the birth of Prince Leopold in 1853 and Princess Beatrice in 1857 and obstetrical analgesia gained public acceptance. Dr. Snow was the first physician to devote his medical practice to the administration of anesthetics, making him the first anesthesiologist and the father of modern anesthesia. This is a picture of him administering the uh, chloroform to uh, Queen Victoria through a, a silk uh, handkerchief and standing beside him is Joseph Thomas Clover. And this royal patronage silenced the last objections to anesthesia. Dr. Tho Joseph Thomas Clover was a student of Dr. John, Dr. John Snow, and he was a person who always uh, uh, suggested that we have to examine the patient before giving anesthesia. So he was a proponent of the pre-anesthetic clinics. He insisted for a finger on the pulse. He insisted that we always monitor the patient's pulse while administering anesthesia. He delivered anesthesia in non-concentrations through his apparatus. And he also designed a mask with inhalation and exhalation and valves. Upon the death of uh, John Snow, Joseph Clover became Britain's leading specialist. And so these two, that is Dr. John Snow and Dr. Joseph uh, Thomas Clover, were chosen as supporters on the college's crust and the Royal Warrant was obtained for the Royal College of Anesthetists. Till 1853, the drugs were all administered via inhalation route and it led to Alexander Wood developing the hypodermic needles and he was assisted by Charles Pravas in this effort. The birth of uh, local anesthetics was in 1884 when cocaine was instilled, a two-person solution was instilled into the eyes of Austrian ophthalmologist Dr. Karl Kohler and he tested its effectiveness by pricking the eye with needles. Spinal algesia for pain relief was introduced in 1885 by James Leonard Corning. And the first surgery under spinal anesthesia was done on 16th August, 1898 by Dr. August Carl Gustav Beer at the University of Kiel for a segmental resection of the left ankle, which was severely infected with tuberculosis. Dr. Bayer injected 15 milligrams of cocaine intrathecally and performed the operation successfully. 10 years down the line, in 1908, Dr. Bayer pioneered the use of intravenous regional anesthesia, a technique which is commonly referred to as Bayer's block. 
Now coming to the advancements in airway management that was done initially till 1880, people were given uh, the inhalation agents either through a, a handkerchief or a mask or either through tracheostomy. Over 1880, the technique of endotracheal anesthesia with the help of orotracheal intubation was described by Sir William McKeven, and this is being practiced even today. And this could avoid the tracheostomy. In 1895, Alfred Christine developed an original otoscope, which was a combination of an esophagoscope and an electroscope with a proximal light from the electroscope. And this is the technique how he did laryngoscopy. Chevalier Jackson in 1913 developed his own laryngoscope. He was the professor of laryngology with a distal uh, light, the distal end, with the illumination at the distal end. Intubation and airway advances occurred with the endotracheal intubation done by McGill and Rowbotham at Queen's Hospital in 1919. Sir Ivan McGill was responsible for the introduction of endotracheal tube, the McGill circuit, the McGill's intubating forceps, the McGill's laryngoscope, the catheter mount, single lung anesthesia, the McGill's tracheal spray for glottic anesthesia, for bobbin flow meters, and for establishing diploma in anesthesia. 1941, Sir Robert Reynolds McIntosh introduced his laryngoscope, which remains the most used even today. In 1894, the first anesthetic charts were introduced into practice by Dr. Harvey Cushing. He suggested that we have to monitor the pulse as well as the blood pressure of the patient and record it during anesthetic procedures. In 1901, epidural anesthesia via the caudal approach was described by two Frenchmen, Dr. Jean Sicard and Fernand Catalin. In 1905, the first professional anesthesia society was formed with nine physicians from Long Island. And in 1911, the society expanded to 23 members and became the New York Society of Anesthetists. In 1936, the society changed its name to the American Society of Anesthetists. And in 1945, it became the, the American Society of Anesthesiologists. In 1914, the first comprehensive a uh, textbook on anesthesia was released by James Taylor Guatemi. And in 1920, the eye signs was described by Dr. Arthur Goodell, uh, the eye signs following ether anesthesia. And uh, he described the four stages of uh, eye signs. He also was instrumental in uh, giving us the Goodell's airway, the cuffed endotracheal tubes, and inhalation anesthesia. In 1922, the first journal, dedicated journal of anesthesia was published, that is the Anesthesia and Analgesia. And in 1923, we had the second journal, that is the British Journal of Anesthesia. In 1927, Rolf and Waters uh, introduced intravenous sodium thiopentol and inhalational cyclopropane into anesthesia practice. It was also instrumental in getting the Waters airway and the to and fro canister for carbon dioxide absorption. Dr. Jonas Lundy popularized thiopentone. He popularized balance anesthesia and he was instrumental in establishing the first blood bank and the first post anesthesia care unit. The WFSA was, uh, was established in 1955 with 26 uh, societies, of which India was one. There were various anesthetic equipments, and the most important one was in 1917 with the Boyle's machine by Henry Edmund Gaskin Boyle. The classification of breathing circuits was done by William Mapleson in 1954. The Ambu bag came into existence in 1957, 54, 56, and that was done by Dr. Henning Rubin. The monitoring devices in 1950s, we had the first nerve stimulator and the blood gas monitoring. And in 1970, the pulmonary artery catheter came into being. In 1974, we had the invention of the pulse oximeter. And in 1990s, show an explosion of new uh, monitoring modalities like the cardiac output monitoring, the depth of anesthesia monitors, and the echocardiography. Similar uh, improvements were taking place in the field of intensive care. In 1929, it was the negative pressure ventilators that was used. However, in 1953, during the Denmark polio epidemic, Dr. Ibsen, he suggested that we have to move on to intermittent positive pressure ventilation, and this definitely saved lives. The mortality reduced by around 60%, and uh, Dr. Ibsen is known as the father of intensive care. What about the Indian scenario for Anesthesia in the pre ether era, uh, it was mainly uh, some Mohini for induction and Sanjeevani for recovery. 
uh, Ethan anesthesia came to India on 22nd March 1847 at uh, Calcutta, where uh, it was administered under the supervision of O. Shoganasi, the surgeon. The first chloroform anesthesia was administered in January 12th, 1848. There were many mortalities in, in the UK due to chloroform anesthesia. However, in India, chloroform was still the most commonly used anesthetic. And uh, the first Hyderabad Commission, Chloroform Commission, uh, which was just, uh, which was um, formed to see how effective chloroform was, suggested that chloroform can be given perfectly safely, and it was not accepted in London. And the second Hyderabad Chloroform Commission was done, where experiments carried on 430 animals and 54 human beings, and again it said that high chloroform is perfectly safe if you monitor the respiration. Incidentally, the first woman and a citizen in India and perhaps in the world, Rupa Bai Firdunji, was working under at Dr. Edward Laurie in Hyderabad in 1889 under the second chloroform, Hyderabad Chloroform Commission. In 1890, after 20 years of accidents due to chloroform, the world began to discard it. However, in India, Till 1928, chloroform was the only anesthetic used and it became synonymous with anesthesia. Chloroform was the popular expression for anesthesia. There were many interesting case reports published in the Indian Medical Gazette. Alexander Crombie used hypodermic morphine in 1880 for smoothening the course of chloroform anesthesia. This was the first documented report of pre-medication in the world. There was an interesting episode in which Mahatma Gandhi was operated upon on 12th January 1925 for an emergency appendicectomy at Sassoon Hospital in Pune. Dr. Date administered open drop chloroform and a notable feature was that electricity failed. The torch that was bought in also got fused and surgeon Canal Maddock uh, completed the operation in the light of a kerosene lamp. In the Indian Medical Gazette, uh, was an advertisement for one paid anesthetist for the Mayo Hospital, Calcutta, and Sassoon Hospital, Pune, and Dr. Jutindra Dath Mukherjee was appointed with, for a salary of rupees 50 per month. The Indian Society of Anesthesiologists was formed in 1947 with a membership of just 19 people, and the first uh, independent uh, <clears throat> conference was conducted in 1965 at Hyderabad, and today we have almost uh, 35,000 uh, anesthesiology memberships, anesthesiologists as members. And the first official journal of the society, that is the IJ, was published in July 1953 with Dr. Ganguly as the first editor. ISA Kerala State Chapter was formed in 1973, and we have a membership of almost 2,300 members right now. So the three A's that modified the anesthetic history was antibiotics, asepsis, and uh, anesthesia. So present status of anesthesia is we have made anesthesia and perioperative care and pain management so safe that our job is too often taken for granted both by the surgeons and the patients. The patients have become so confident about the safety of anesthesia that they, during even during the anesthetic, tend to play their, uh, tend to be on mobiles and play their favorite games. The modern anesthesiologist is often compared with that of a pilot and we have many uh, traits that are common. The pre-flight checklist, a pilot will not fly the aircraft unless the ground staff and maintenance team gives 100% fitness to the flight. However, as anesthesiologists during our PSC, we have to take up patients with calculated risk. The takeoff is similar to the induction of anesthesia. It, in it involves physical, psychological, mental alertness, full concentration, the margin of safety is narrow. The maintenance phase is similar to a flight with turbulence, which may or may not be anticipated. So the level of alertness, vigilance, and concentration cannot be lowered, and duration of this period cannot be anticipated most of the time. Landing is similar to reversal of anesthesia, which is the most difficult time in the whole process, requiring mental capability and skill more than that at the time of induction. And margin of safety is lowest at this phase, as most of the controls are being slowly released. Taxiing of the aircraft is similar to the post-operative period, but stress on the anesthesiologist does not end here as he's accountable even during this phase. So these are the, some of the similarities. Now the difference is that the airline pilot is permitted to fly only eight hours in a 24 hour period and 30 hours in seven days as per FAA regulation, but nothing has been mentioned to standardize work hours for that of an anesthesiologist. Now with the advent of ERAS, we have uh, uh, been able to give better outcomes to the patient 
and coming to the safety of anesthesia, this was Hannah Greener. This was the first reported mortality from, uh, from an anesthetic overdose of chloroform. And today we are proud to say that anesthesia is cited as the only specialty in healthcare to have reached six sigma defect rate. That is a process in which 99.99966% of the end products are statistically free of defects. So definitely death rate has come down, but we should strive hard to reduce the morbidity that is associated, especially the post-operative nausea, vomiting, neural tap, dental injury, et cetera. So if you look at the fact sheet of the roles of anesthesiologist, the, the roles are many in resuscitation, intensive care, not only in the OR, we have non-operating room anesthesia roles to uh, play. So in the ideal anesthetic is a multitasking ninja. So from our vantage point of working with physicians and nurses or multiple specialists, all stages of surgery and recovery, we can coordinate episodes of care for patients in the pre, post and intraoperative phases, helping to lessen patient risk factors and improve their outcome. A few words on the future of anesthesiology, probably the stethoscope will move, make way for the um, uh, echocardiogram probes that are for examining the patient, the anesthesia care records would be a matter of the past with electronic anesthesia records in the pre-operative evaluation as well as in the intraoperative period. The anesthesia information management systems are going to play a big role where the data is captured from the anesthesia machine, the physiologic patient monitor and other equipments, and you get, a, you get the records. Now, if artificial intelligence is added to the system, leading to decision support systems, it will really help in the management of patients as shown here where the uh, monitor could easily detect intraoperative hypotension and hyper hypertension too, and adequately warn the anesthesiologist. Similarly, uh, the reducing wastage of inhalation anesthetic using real-time decision support to notify of excessive fresh gas flow has also been studied. Fetal surgery is coming up in a big way and is a challenge. It probably uh, is a challenge because we have to take care of both the mother and the baby in this case. And similarly, uh, robotics are invading our operating rooms. We know the about the famous Da Vinci surgeon robot. We have uh, robotic scrub nurse Penelope, and we have MechSleepy, who is the first robotic anesthesiologist. It's a closed loop control system that monitors the patient's depth of consciousness, level of pain, and muscle movements throughout surgery and intravenously administers appropriate doses of the respective medications. Uh, on the acquired data. The goal here is not to replace anesthesiologists, but to assist them. Similarly, we have the world's first uh, intubation robot, that is the Kepler intubation system, and the first robotic ultrasound guided nerve blocks in humans using the Magellan system. So we have robotic, uh, robotic C1 and 4 region anesthesia. Now, nanotechnology has made great strides in anesthesia. The neuro electronic interfacing is going to play a big role in general anesthesia. Similarly, in region anesthesia, pi electron rich injectable nanoparticle can counteract high spinal by uh, making rendering the bupivacaine non toxic by uh, forming pi pi complexes with it. Similarly, we could have rapid local transdermal anesthetic like nano lido gel. In pain and palliative care, we, the use of saxitoxin by bundling it with liposomes. So there's a slow release formation. So the nerve block can last from days to weeks to even months. At the same time, being non toxic to the surrounding tissue. In critical care, especially in organophosphorus poisoning, giving IV. Atropine in the field might be a problem. So the development of uh, nanoatropine sulfate, that is dry powder inhaler, could act as an antidote. Similarly, respirocytes can uh, speed up weaning from ventilators, microbivores. Microbivores could mimic white cells and perform phagocytosis. So these microbivores could be the future answer to rapidly evolving antibiotic systems. So the future of anesthesiology, we should have broad training in the fundamentals of medicine. Emphasis should be on the most severe level, a thorough training and participation as a team is very important. So if you duck this challenge, others will not. And anesthesiologists risk being sidelined from activities we are trained for so many years to perform we would have to discuss about the extinction theories. So the changes around the profession are not a threat, but a series of opportunities. Great innovation is knowing how to build and create the future. The future of anesthesiology is indeed very bright. So don't panic at the challenges. Always organize and attack the challenge back. So I would like to conclude by saying it's not the strongest of the species that survives, nor the most intelligent, but the one that is most responsive to change. So that was a brief evolution of uh, the anesthetist. And I would like to say thank you once again.